Okay. So uh, Harris is here from the Houston office, and we were talking about a little bit of the our you know things that we work on, and one of our uh, one of our topics is also investors. Yeah. And um, you know, in Dallas, we have investors that are investing in all sorts of different projects. In residential specifically, we don't have a lot of inventory. So now, if you've got the means to buy uh, land and develop properties, you know, especially with the high interest rates, if you've got if you can do cash heavy or do hard money. You, that's where you would put your money right now because anything that comes out that's new and ready to go and move in gets sold and it's still high dollar and it's, it's, and it's, and it's crazy. All, in all different price points, like from $300,000 houses all the way to $3 million houses. And uh, I don't know how it is in Houston. Is it uh, similar? Uh, we're pretty much seeing the same thing in Houston. You know, li like you just said, anything that's like new, moving ready, and obviously has to be well priced for the area, like it's going, and people will always want new over old. And to your point, you're seeing some builders who are cash heavy, those are the ones who are being able to take advantage of the opportunities in place, right? Lot deals, being able to hold on to the land, develop later or develop now, to sell now. You have the builders who rely on that hard money, they're having a little bit tougher time and they're kind of slowing pace until things kind of taper off a little bit. Yeah. Are you seeing here also opportunities in the same respect where, you know, like we just said, you know, new houses that are ready and priced well get, you know, fly off the hook. What about older properties that are sitting on the market for a while for, you know, for somebody that wants to put a little bit of elbow grease of their own and do a little bit of work on themselves? Are there opportunities? Like there are. Dallas, there are. Like most of the opportunities are found off market um, or it takes somebody who is doing the elbow, who, who's basically doing the sweat equity themselves um, because the market, the, the properties that are coming on the market that needs the work, the, the prices still haven't come down enough in order to have the gap that's needed. In order yeah, to I've found some opportunities like that where everybody prices, everybody thinks their house is the best house that's ever been mm -hmm. built. And the older ones that do need the work, it takes a while. And sometimes they're on the market for like 100 days. Right. And if they're on the market for 100 days, that's when I start looking. I'm like, that's ready to go down. And you can buy opportunities of those for yourself, for other people, for spec, for flippers, for, right. for all that kind of thing. And I find opportunities in that respect too. Yeah, and you and once it hits that, like you said, hundred day mark or four month mark, the opportunities come when you hit them up before they do that next price reduction, because then you're not having the competition of the other people. Who, everyone's looking for opportunities. Right. Right. But and you give them that option, like they know you're hanging out there exactly. for at the right price that you would take it, and so exactly. you already have that relationship with them. Absolutely. Exactly. And stuff that's fallen off the market. You know, we there's there's several times recently where we've called on canceled listings or expired listings, mm -hmm. and just said, hey, you had it priced at this price. It's not a realistic price. Obviously, it didn't sell. But at this price, would you take it? And they'd say, you know, yes or no or whatever. But if it's a yes, we may have five investors ready to go to just. To, yeah, to I mean, you off. show someone an opportunity, you show someone a light at the end of the tunnel. You know, if they're in the right situation, you know, opportunities there. Have you ever had a situation where you're um, you do such a good job on a house that you get another pick up another listing in the in the neighborhood, and they're like, "Well, we heard you sold that house for." 400 bucks a foot, right? And it's a $350 neighborhood. Yeah. And then they're expecting you to do the same? Of course. And <laughs> yeah, what do course. you do in those situations? I have that well, shit happen you, all the time. <laughs> you know, you just have to have honest conversations with them and, and explain the story of, of how you had that successful sale and maybe what about that house made it a premium price. You know, make them understand. But it's tough when people see that shiny big number, they want it too. Yeah, sometimes being really good works against you in those regards, because yeah. they do come to you and they're like, well, you got that 400 for that house. My house is way better than that house. Of course. You're like, you know, trying to be a, trying to be nice to them and not, you know, this is a home that they've lived in. Of course. You don't yeah. want to be disrespectful. You want to tell them, you know, right. how it, but you also want to be honest with them and saying that your house isn't exactly like the other one. Has yeah, I mean, ultimately they're coming to us because they need someone who has, who's going to bring real advice and real knowledge. You yeah. know, and not lead them astray because if you lead them astray, then it's going to sit for a hundred days and they're going to get mad at us, you know? Right, right, you know? right. Where if we tell them what's real up front, it yes. might take a couple of weeks, but eventually they'll come around. I found out what works a lot also for me is to manage their expectations in that regard and mm -hmm. tell them like, look, your house is not that house, for instance. Your house is really at 350, just like these, most of these other houses. But if you really want to try for 400, let's go for it. But let's put a plan in place that if we don't have 10 showings at this price or if we don't have an offer by this date, then we'll start lowering the price by 50000 or 20000 or whatever 
to where it gets to something what I believe is more realistic. I don't want to leave money on the table too. Our you know interests are aligned. The more you, we sell it for, the more money I make. For sure. But I also want to be realistic and not you know give them la la land ideas. Yeah, the th the thing I talk to people about is like this bid ask range. A guy from a buddy of mine, he's an old trader. This this term, right? You want to be within or the ballpark, right? You want okay. to be within the ballpark of what's reasonable. And the beauty of the market right now with a low inventory environment, if you have a good product in an area that doesn't have a lot of availability, you can do a test price. But like you said, let's not be egregious and let's have a plan in place so that if in the next, in the first like week, 10 days, 14 days max, we're not seeing the action we want, we implement that action plan, which pretty much is a price reduction. Right, because the other converse situation that happens is it becomes stigmatized. Yep. That that's the crazy guy that wants 400 bucks a foot for his property and he's not negotiating with anybody. And mm -hmm. then after it gets sits for 100 days or more, right. then guys, you know, the, the Yeah, what's the wrong? Why isn't it selling? Why isn't it selling? Yep. What happened? Yep. And, you, you know, working with buyers, they're all like, oh, it's been on the market for 100 days. they got to be desperate. Let's lowball them. And then you get far lower than what you could have gotten. And it creates that kind of a stigma on that property, which is hard to climb back out. Of. Yeah, and so like you said, the goal is is set expectations up front. Say, hey, we'll test your price, but just know if we don't see what we want, we need to do go into this reasonable range that I think it's really worth. Yeah, I'm with you there.